talk about uh, the first couple. So the, the first item is 2019-20 final review. So as you know, uh, the strategic plan really is the map for our district. And we really pay attention to those key initiatives and other initiatives that help drive the district forward. Uh, in the areas of key initiatives, we provide a quarterly update. This is the final quarterly update, so this wraps up the 2019-20 year for these key initiatives. Uh, any, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them, but other, otherwise, I'll just keep moving. Any questions on that first one? Okay, and we'll continue to provide those quarterly updates on key initiatives in the district. We put those on our website as well. Uh, the second item uh, is the annual, annual stakeholder survey. So for many years now, we have conducted a parent survey, a staff survey, and a student survey, students in grades 3, 6, 8, and 12, on a host of quest detailed questions. Uh, what we've included here for our community is the highest level questions for each of those stakeholder groups. And so when we look at them, uh, we are really reviewing them. I don't know who's driving the machine. Is that you, Barb? Okay. So we see on slide one our number of respondents. Go ahead to slide two and just hold it there for a second. So at the very highest level, you know, are you satisfied with the Pine Richland School District? Um, at the very highest level, what is the you know your satisfaction with the overall academic program and so on? And the advantage of having so many years of data now is it allows us to look at the not only the level 
of satisfaction, but it allows us to look at the trends over time to see directionally, are we, are we moving in the right direction? The actual results, the actual number of questions, there, there are many for each of these surveys. And so in each area of each survey, we're able to look at the specific detail and identify you know, relative strengths and relative opportunities for improvement. One of the things that we are so proud of, especially in this last year, which was impacted by COVID-19, is in almost every case, we are seeing increased levels of satisfaction from all three of those mm -hmm. groups, students, parents, and staff. That is through teamwork, focus, and systematically trying to improve the way we're going about things. So our concern this year, frankly, was will the most recent experience of COVID sort of be in people's minds or could they think it really reflect across the entire year? So we were just um, you know, really pleased uh, to see those results. But again, we now dig into them. So principals will be able to disaggregate the results by building. And they're only able to look specifically at their building and see what's, what's happening there. In our workforce groups, we look at teachers as compared to paraprofessionals, compared to other groups. So we don't just look at the high level, we get down into the, to the weeds of the detail as well. Good? Okay. Next one uh, shows the key initiatives for this upcoming year. So Barb, if you could just pull that up. The only point I want to make on this, and we just had a workshop um, with our board and senior leadership team. Um, while the strategic plan is our map, we have to be willing and able to be flexible as conditions change. So the environmental uh, sort of scan that happens every year has resulted in a couple of different changes for 2021. The first one being the next item. COVID-19 and its impact on our regular in-person and virtual programming. But if you look down to the third bullet, we see budget awareness in future focused financial planning. The reality of COVID-19, not just in our region or in our country, but in the world, is that we uh, and others will see the economic impact. The economic impact will impact our revenues, and will also make, help us sort of filter and determine what our programming looks like and what implications there have there. All of that connects. So one of our major areas of focus this next year is increasing the number of people in our community who have a, but a higher level of budget awareness and also understand how our planning and work looks out into the future. So generally, People don't think about budget or finance unless, A, there's a tax increase. So if there's something that impacts an individual homeowner or business owner, that sort of has an impact. Or in, in a difficult times, it's around programming. And so our goal is really here to increase awareness and understanding. So how those pieces fit together and how it all works um, can be better understood and questions can be responded to and so forth. Good. How's my volume with my mask? Fine. So let me demonstrate here briefly. I'm going to turn this thing on. So you can now hear my voice differently. Yes? Mm -hmm. So what I'm wearing right now is something we're going to talk about as we get to the next item. I'm actually speaking really quietly in my mask. This microphone connects to that white speaker in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. So these types of systems for voice amplification, we have the, them in our district. In fact, Richland Elementary has them in almost every general education classroom. As we contemplate return to school in the fall, and we think about what will that practically look like, imagine being an educator, a teacher, with something like this on all day. It's hard to even contemplate. And so little tools like this, which connect to a microphone, allow a teacher to almost whisper, and you can still hear that. And so there are advantages, not just in the case of masks or COVID-19, but for that student who's sitting next to the unit ventilator in a classroom, 
or for a student who has a hearing impairment or for just general ability to communicate clearly. So again, wanted to demo that. Um, we are six feet apart, so I feel, I feel comfortable. This, I have likened to the old Halloween dress up mask. You know, <laughs> you have a rubber band stapled to a mask and you hope that you can get through Halloween with that sucker on. This is uh, a face shield. So this was picked up today. And as another option, as we think about what that might look like, now students can see the face of the teacher. It's a little, um, the only challenge with this amplification system is in my ears, my voice sounds really loud. And that's because of the, the shield and how that sort of plays around with that. But again, all of that are things to get used to. But the director of the Allegheny County Health Department suggested this type of alternative because it covers the eyes, it covers the, the mouth, it provides a barrier, but it may also be more tolerable. And that was something that came up in our Pine Richland Healthcare Leadership Council. So more tolerable to be able to wear something like this for extended periods of time as opposed to the mask. So again, uh, just a little, uh, a little demo for everybody. Uh, so getting into any questions on the key initiatives. So I just had one uh, feedback was from a teacher at Richland Elementary who said that that microphone really helped just her voice by the end of the day. It wasn't as tired mm -hmm. or, or as you know, irritating to the throat from having to project and speak. <coughs> so so I'll, I'll share just using that this is one example, you know, Guidelines are written to provide guidance. And so the CDC and Pennsylvania Department of Health and others, they issue guidance to provide their best thinking about what promotes health of people. They're not necessarily thinking about what does that look like in a school environment? What does that look like in a classroom? What does that mean on a school bus? And so one of the challenges of preparing for return to school is trying to understand schools are socially dynamic, interactive mm -hmm. environments. That is what they are. You can't, you could remove half of the students and still have a social dynamic <laughs> interactive environment. And so our challenge as we get into this uh, topic is to understand the guidance then understand schools deeply and try to figure out what is a reasonable, practical approach that can be implemented to provide for a meaningful learning experience for mm -hmm. students. And we cannot expect someone in Allegheny County Health Department to be expert on what school looks like at Pine Richland or any other school in Allegheny mm -hmm. County. So it's up to us to work with our teams and people to identify what we think are appropriate, reasonable, doable, implementable sort of ideas, and then be able to, uh, to go from there. So I'm gonna hit a few things here on item 2.04. And there's a bunch of information in public content, more detail than we typically put in. And Ms. Hathorn is also updating our COVID-19 um, website uh, for the district. So podcast went out to our families on June 5th. We have since received guidance from Pennsylvania about return to school. And so simply, we have a responsibility to develop a health and safety plan. That's the, the terminology. And the board will need to take action to approve ultimately that plan. When that plan is approved by the board, it would be submitted to PDE. They have, they're not going to say yay or nay, they're merely going to receive it. They're not gonna receive it and say, hey, I really like this part, you might want it. They're just receiving it. So they have taken the guidance and they've said, here's the guidance. You have to do what is feasible or to the extent possible meet these guidelines and expectations. And so one of the other components of requirements of the plan is that we have a pandemic coordinator 
and we will have co-coordinators with Dr. Justice and me. You don't have to be a public health expert in order to be a co-coordinator. It just means getting the right people in the room and then leveraging their knowledge and skill to be able to do what we need to do. So neither of us are uh, super expert in that, but we feel confident we can help lead the team. And then a pandemic council or team. For us, we had already put in place this idea of the Pine Richland Healthcare Leadership Council. Uh, so Barb, I'm gonna have you pull up the slide from that for a second. And board members, you can pull this up. It, it's titled with that uh, on, your, on your slide. And then if you want to go, I think it's maybe slide six or so. It has all the participants. Right there, stop right there. So yeah. So you can see, and this is publicly posted, you can see that right now we have 43 members of the Pine Richland Healthcare Leadership Council. 43 is not a good working number, so this number is really the sounding board uh, for getting some feedback on our planning from healthcare experts who reside in our community. And so you can see on the list, we have our senior team because we touch all the components. We have administrators from every building level. We have Dr. Paxan because there are certainly mental health and other supports and services that are connected to this whole thing. We have Mr. Zimmerman, Mr. Simmons is here tonight because we're gonna to talk about athletics and activities in a, in a few minutes, Mr. Gruber. Staff from various levels, different workforce groups. We also have two of our building level tech coaches. Uh, Mrs. Misback is a part of our uh, team. We have two students uh, who are part of that group, key partners that are relevant. And then you'll see 12 medical and public health experts. So if you could go, Barb, to slide, I think it's maybe eight or it's a few further. One more, keep going, keep going, keep going. Right there, okay. So. These are the, we had a little over 30 members of our community who have expertise in some manner in the public health medical uh, field express a willingness to be a part of this council. We obviously could not manage that, that many. And so one of the, we looked at a, a number of criteria, one of which was direct experience in something connected to COVID-19. This group of 12, uh, 11 of whom are members of our community. One is our school physician, Dr. Mantella. Those that are a part of our community, most of them have children in schools actively. A number of them have multiple children at multiple levels. So we have the entire K-12 student span covered through these parents slash experts. We have community members who uh, have graduates, former graduates of Pine Richland, but are still um, vested into the community. And so, and they represent different areas. So this group at our first meeting, which was last Tuesday, we went around the horn and each of these experts was able to give one to two minutes uh, or two to three minutes of what is it that they know and understand that is relevant for us to consider as we go through this planning process. And I've summarized that a bit in the public content notes, but to, to share that sort of at the highest level possible. They're generally of the belief that we can return to school. However, we need to really respect COVID-19. We cannot, as a group, allow the low um, confirmed case rate of students in the five to 18 area, let us not um, give due respect to COVID-19. So we need to be aware of it. And at the same time, understand that it's children who may carry or uh, put others at risk in the home or in the community who might be in an at-risk population. That's something for us to, to be mindful of. Many of them described the, the changes in understanding. So it's either changes in COVID-19 over time or it's changes in the data and understanding of what that means and what that looks like to sort of know that trying to plan two months ahead for something that is evolving at a, at a more rapid rate and being understood, just to, to use caution in that regard. But they all provided 
what I would say is the, the hope or belief that we can put a lot of things in place in a return to school plan that can, uh, that can give us the opportunity to do that. And that message from them aligns with what we're hearing uh, from the Pennsylvania Department of Education about some of the details of what goes into that. Uh, Barb, if you could go back, uh, back a slide. Uh, keep going. It's the one that says uh, traditional in person and virtual, so it's got two columns to it. Okay, that's good right there. So before we get into uh, sort of what, what is the functional work we're doing, we wanted to do a preliminary uh, survey in order to get a pulse and understanding from members of the community about what are they thinking about. Uh, the minute the 2019-20 school year ended, immediately questions about the return to school in the fall began. And we're hearing some strong opinions. You know, so I receive communication that says, you know, we need to be back in school, period. No masks, no precautions, we need to just do it. And then equally, I receive some that say, if we do not have a 100% virtual option, they're not going to be able to keep their children in the Pine Richland School District. So we have these sort of completely opposite, strongly held positions by, different, by people within the same community. And so that fits obviously with the idea of a continuum that we talked about. And what we're working on right now and the reason we sent the preliminary survey, and it's hard to answer a preliminary survey. If you're a parent, you can answer that question. You know, based on what I know now, would I, what would I be doing with my child in the fall? Well, parents might be ready to, you know, for many reasons, I'd send them back to school. Um, and about 81 or whatever percent of our family said, I'd send, we want to send our child back to school with the precautions. 10% said uh, virtual and then 9% or so on the fence. And so what was helpful to us is that gives us an initial, you know, something to understand what our families are thinking about. Of those that would send their child back to school, 61% of them said they could drive their child to school in order to reduce loading on the buses and allow us to create a better situation there. That's positive. We expected it and it confirmed what we thought might happen. But we also ask the question differently than I think some other places. It's one thing to say you're, you're going to send your child back to traditional in-person instruction. What if we were to notify you that we have a confirmed case in the school? Would you still send your child back? What if, and most of them said yes, we would. What if we let you know that there was a confirmed case of COVID-19 in your child's class, someone directly who they're connected to, and that number changed? So now about 60% didn't feel quite so good about that. So the reality of this is that even if someone has, holds a, a feeling about what they're looking for right now today, how the disease progresses, what precautions are put in place, all of those factors are gonna impact how confident they feel and what's going on. So, as, so what we are thinking at this point is that we need to provide for what does the in-person look like with the details and then what does the virtual look like. Now, we, have, we do not know yet how will we manage both of those things concurrently. You know, so as we responded and prepared and reacted and improved in the spring, it was with everybody in a virtual environment. Now we have an additional variable, right, which is some in, some out, and how do we manage that? So we're gonna have to work through that. We don't have you know, a clarity on that right now, we're, but our, our heads are in the game and that's what we're spending you know, our time beginning to think about. Uh, so where we're really focused is on the in-person instruction. So in between the healthcare leadership council meetings, so think of them as like the big milestone markers. We'll have those at certain frequency over the course of the next six weeks. Our next one is scheduled for this Thursday. In between those mile markers is the work. So the work is 
functionally organized so that we can really dig into the details. So exactly what does the bus look like? So when you step onto a bus, we have a driver of a bus who generally speaking is in that at-risk population. If you've ever seen school bus drivers, they, if they share a characteristic, it's that many of them are retired from a, a different line of work or, or job and many of them are grandparents, they're, they're elderly, they're right in the target risk group. So we have to provide an environment on that bus that allows them to feel confident and comfortable coming back to work and driving. We already have shortages in bus drivers across the country and we need to, to do the best we can for kids. So when a student walks on the bus, we have hand sanitizer, masks will be required in that setting, specifically in that setting, because we can't really establish a lot of physical distancing. But with the parents who are willing to drive their students, with the precautions that we can put in place on how we load and where that sanitizer is and what that looks like, we believe that we can sort of solve that challenge. Dismissal, we're not quite there yet. We've got to figure that one out. Arrival, we feel 100% good about. So even the same thing, you know, arrival, it's easy to go back to front, right? First on, sit with your sibling. There's a lot of things we can do to manage morning pickup. What do you do when to minimize some of that interaction in the way? So we'll, we'll figure that out, but that's just one example. Um, the at-home part. We're going to need parents to understand the symptoms of COVID-19 and be willing to do a habit at home about checking for their children and, and seeing if they're symptomatic. The problem is that the symptom list for COVID-19 is identical to the symptoms for just about any other thing that would happen, headache, you know, coughing, Etc. And so that's a real puzzle on how to discern, you know, what that looks like. But as a school district, you know, it's one of those one in doubt when you're seeing things. The the guidance would be, you know, you stay home. You know, to to value that and to be able to manage it, um, you know, appropriately that way. Temperature is the same thing. Students must have their temperature taken. It doesn't mean we have to have at least everything we know right now that we have to do ourselves a forehead scan of 4,600 students or 80% of 4,600 students every day. But we will need parents to attest somehow to us that they've done this at home. And for those that are unable, we can provide an option and be able to manage a smaller number on a routine basis. So again, it's this bridge between what does the guidance say? What does the school environment look like? And how do we bridge that in a way that is um, you know, manageable for, for our students and families, and so on, and so on, and so on. Shared equipment, classes, et cetera. Physical distancing is easily the most challenging circumstance in a school environment. And so, you know, CDC says six feet. Some of the other countries that are implementing student return to school plans are less clear about that six feet. Like Singapore is an example of one who has one to two meters, three to six feet in terms of the distancing. And so we can provide, and I think we shared uh, some pictures on how can we design in a classroom columns and rows spaced as far apart. And we can get the desks about five feet off center which is about three and a half or three feet between students. We can have hand sanitizer when they walk in. We can have procedures for the, the cleaning of spaces. But what we talk about in uh, the public content here is there are certain fundamentals that we will need to be able to demonstrate at a level higher than have ever been demonstrated before in public schools. You know, so. The experts all say, wash your hands appropriately. You know, not the one second under the cold water and I might have touched the soap, you know, but instead, use soap, wash, use the hand sanitizer. So we will have a hand sanitizer um, unit in every classroom in our district and they've been already you know, putting those in place. When you go in, you go to your space. If you're going to cough or sneeze, you have to do that appropriately. 
and then wash and be able to, to clean those surfaces. If you've ever stood, and I know you have, in a class full of students, if you closed your eyes on any day, close your eyes, you're going to hear noses snorting, coughing, sneezing. I mean, kids are, you know, they're, yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it is the environment. So we can't create a culture where when somebody coughs or sneezes, the immediate anxiety, fear, worry, or action is like, you know, we've got to create a surgical operating theater and um, that's, that person has COVID. No, they, they coughed. And so how do we balance this? This is not simple. And we're trying to get into the weeds in our planning and then come out of the weeds into something that can be fundamentally implemented. So in a few minutes, we're going to hear um, about athletics and activities. And there is a very detailed plan. Pennsylvania schools, K-12, are permitted to, and, and we include activities in that, even though that wasn't expressly a part of the original thing, like marching band and some of the other activities that would happen. Again, develop a health and safety plan. There's a 26 or 27 page plan attached to this item that has a whole number of things that need to be um, addressed. And if, these, if this plan can be developed, it needs to be locally approved by the boards. So, you know, you could think about that local approval anyway. I like it because I would prefer to have, while it would be nice if somebody could wave a magic wand and give us a perfect answer to every question and have it be practical, I'm comfortable with us using our best collective judgment in putting in place reasonable things and then improving as time goes on. But this, uh, at the end of the day, Mr. Simmons is here, he's got input and, and there's interest and there's mental health, there's all sorts of positive benefits that can come from re-engaging. But how do we do that? And the way we do that isn't through a 27 page report, it's through disciplined attention to the fundamentals of each of those sports or groups. So it's the volleyball coach understanding the 27 pages, getting trained as a part of professional development, and then applying that information to her kids and her sport in a way that she can manage with discipline. It's about owning the fundamentals. So if we have a coach or we have a teacher or we have an administrator who, when they're asked to put on a mask, rolls their eyes or says, oh, they just made me, that's not a healthy way to respond. That's not a mature response. We need the, the coaches to understand that it isn't about getting back for day one. It's about getting back for day one and exercising the disciplined attention to detail that will allow us to come back for day two and three and four and week two and month one and stay. The, that's hard because if you're like me and you look around the community, our community and others, you're seeing all sorts of things. You know, you're seeing kids that are together in pool parties with no physical distancing and they're all over. And then you're seeing homes where parents are cautious and trying to do, you know, you're seeing this whole range and that's what's happening outside of school. We can't control all of that, but we can, with discipline and planning, identify what are the, um, the areas of focus within the school and, and then gradually build those. But it's going to come down to the teacher, the coach, the sponsor, understanding how do I apply this? to my area, to our kids, and then how do I really stay disciplined? Not because Mr. Simmons said you had to, not because Dr. Miller said you had to, not because the board said you had to, but because we want to re-engage kids. We want to meet the, the expectations that are there. We, we know that's good and positive and healthy, but only if it's managed in a disciplined way with attention to those fundamentals. And so what's, what I also like about the health and safety plan for athletics and activities 
is the same general template for that is the general template for what will be happening as we prepare return to school. The difference is the timing. So um, all around us right now, other, re other school districts, similar conversations are taking place and boards are being asked to consider these things. And so what we would like to do is, and we ask for it later in the agenda, is to schedule a virtual meeting on the 29th for likely this health and safety plan for athletics and activities. And there might be a couple personnel things that we pop in there. But the purpose tonight was to get it publicly up there, have any discussion or questions and respond to those. Um, different dominoes have to start tipping over as we prepare our coaches for, for all of that. And then once approval um, is provided, then we would begin to implement that. And um, that will help us also start to feel and better understand our planning for 4,600 students and, and how we do that. Not as an experiment, but as a sort of step-by-step -step process that ties to um, a safe environment. So I think I hit most of the things that I had on here. Again, we see the, the statistics that, that I referenced, the, the fundamentals that are indicated there. Um, you know, the other, the final thing, and uh, Mrs. Williams reminded me of this today, you know, is ultimately um, the habits that come with return to school and all the stuff that might be there. We're going to need that to start to get built into the, into the students before they get here. Can't be I go from, you know, and open it I'm like totally uh, out there doing something today and then I've got to go to seven hours so as we get towards the fall there are certain things that we'll, kids will be better um, connected to at home and then we can be reinforcing each other you know parent and school can be working together to reinforce things with kids so um, I'll pause there there's a lot of information here and there's a lot of work to be done um, and so let's go with any, any comments, reactions, questions, or more specifically, we have Dr. P and Mr. Simmons here around the athletics component and activities component. Well, me specifically, I, I just had a question about, it, it ties into a lot of things. Transportation is one that I think of a lot because I know a lot of the bus drivers with, with their age and in particular the special needs students uh -huh. because that's a much closer, more intimate um, setting with uh, 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 the close proximity of the bus drivers and the aides with the, um, with the students, but also a lot of those students are gonna be unable to wear a mask uh, uh -huh. because of their conditions. I mean, some of them, you know, if you touch, uh, face touch, things like that. So uh, I, I don't know if the answer's already there, but that's just something that's going to need to be considered and then throughout the day Correct. again those students are going to be in situations where they're going to be in close proximity mm -hmm. i know that 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 when you put them try to put a mask on some of those mm -hmm. students it's going to be more detrimental than Correct. a lot of other things so is the is the plan that we look at at having them being virtual or out of the building or are in building um with just different um uh, focus let's put it that way so on the in-person side of this and we have a very rough sort of I, we're probably up to 36 working slides on each of those components in the classroom um, it's going to vary by level and then we have slot we have we're going to have to focus type of classroom special education you know autistic support life skills may look differently than a learning support classroom, right? So it, and Mr. Huswit will be a part of uh, a part of that work. But at the principal's uh, retreat over the next two days, Wednesday is almost purely focused to these questions. So it's gonna be classroom by classroom, and then likely student by student thinking about what will that look like, how will that look, and what can we do? And so the answer is gonna probably depend on um, the individual case and how that might fit. Yeah. I knew you guys would have it. I just wanted to Yeah, we, we wish we had the answer, but we have the work planned anyway. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for being so thorough and uh, extensive and documenting all of these processes. It's great. Um, 
question about um, setting setting points where if you cross a certain threshold it would trigger some sort of change in operations have you all been discussing what yeah. some of those might look like so um, so the other requirement of the health and safety plans both in general return to school and athletic activities is that we have to work in consultation with our local health department so we work with the Allegheny County Health Department they are also overwhelmed they're overwhelmed so they're managing every business restaurant organization municipality school district etc so um, they are our answer to that question so for example if we were to have a confirmed case or if we were to go through we have reporting requirements with Allegheny County and then we would help take direction from them about you know what does one case mean what does two cases mean and what would happen in school so um, ultimately that will come from them they're not they don't have the capacity to support all of the school districts individually and so the system that's been set up within the last couple of weeks and the literal director of the Allegheny County Health Department was on our call last week and I did I don't always actively participate in some of the AIU based um, conversations but this one I did on behalf of the district asking very specific questions about our areas of greatest interest like physical distancing like the etc um, they are going to work with the AIU superintendents in our in the task groups that are assigned there so there's 42 school districts in Allegheny County plus city of Pittsburgh Pittsburgh public so 43 the superintendents from those groups are formed into different task groups Allegheny County will provide multiple people to support those different task groups and then we will be able to bring back the answers to those types of questions and insert them within the planning that's happening at local school districts because re it's really a regionalized kind of approach to what's going on so those are on the list uh, what emerged today though is a perfect example uh, schools are required to have an isolation area so if you have some th somebody who is potentially symptomatic of COVID-19 how do you isolate that person student or staff member from other people again the the first question is how do you know the symptoms that you see are related to COVID-19 or any other uh, respiratory or other kind of illness that happens you know so uh, we're looking for direction for that because our school nurses are going to have to understand what is the decision tree on what do I do here we have students who receive medicine every day it's a part of their day they have to stop at the health office how do we provide daily meds to students who need them without putting them in and out of an environment that has people with maybe any other active symptoms so like we will take that direction from Allegheny County um, but I'm not sure they're there yet so it's going to take us these next couple of months to for them to get there and for us to have an understanding of that yeah, thank you anything athletic related I was going to ask I just want to know because we're going to be typically they come back uh, a lot of the athletics come back before school starts what's the plan where where are we I know a lot of folks are struggling with that so, at all levels but where are we what are we getting from the IEA what are we getting so what the old center I would start with it's attached to this so the athletic plan is attached to this item it's 26 or 27 pages and it walks through the very specific details of phases and gradual return uh, it includes things like starting at the varsity level adding other levels introducing marching band and so forth so it, it walks through that entire progression and all of the various required components so custodial cleaning practices uh, communications um, you name it dis distancing within the team what does that look like within the sport etc um, so that those details are those are the details that was not created in a vacuum so that was created not only with others input at Pine Richland but across the athletic directors in this region coming together with their best thinking uh, it, it aligns with the PIAA and with um, 
you know, anything coming from the Whippeal. Okay. And the National Federation of High Schools probably has influence there as well. I think another part that I had read in that was that the um, education of the the coaches, the, the yes, um, it's a requirement. The, the students, the community, it's all a requirement. Correct. And, yeah, and so. So a lot of what happens soon. So the way this is written is that it would be possible for varsity sports to begin after July one. That's not in their like that's not in their competition season, but they're doing conditioning and other activities. So they're able to begin to get into some of those out of season uh, open gyms, um, conditioning, strength and conditioning, et cetera. So each of those sort of each team would have its own uh, individual things, you know. So soccer, I look at Mr. Kenny because anytime I think about soccer, I think about Mr. Kenny. So soccer um, certainly would be different than volleyball, which would certainly be different than football. And so what does that look like for each sport? So, you know, again, in my analogy, this is like a baton passing. 27 pages covers each of those details. But the coach has to receive that, understand it, but then come up with a very clear plan of what will that look like in my sport? You know, what will that look like? What will I do and how do I comply with that? Because we're gonna need it to be different, differentiated based upon the activity itself. I can give you, if you want, just a real high level game plan of how we see rolling this out because again, as Dr. Miller's been saying, it's taking it from plan, comprehensive plan to implementation with, with kids and, and coaches. So tonight, well, developing the plan was kind of phase one, and, and as, as he mentioned, collaborating with other athletic departments um, across the region, that's what Sean has been doing. And then um, obviously all the guidelines given to us through PDE and CDC, those are integrated into this plan. So tonight was to share the initial draft of the plan with the board and community and, and, and listen to feedback um, with a timeline of, of perhaps July 1 of bringing students back. Again, condi conditioning is not required, but if you think about participating in, in a sport, it's important because you don't want to just come from not doing much to to getting into it so so there is importance of having this this opportunity um, from here then it's refinement based upon feedback and then the request for next monday to have the um, approval for the plan if that plan's approved um, we all we have the professional development that has to happen as well so our our thought is as early as this week is meeting with the coaches that would be still a virtual meeting with the coaches and going through step by step of what does it mean big picture and then what does it mean for football for soccer for field hockey for tennis for volleyball and all the fall sports and that's where we're asking the coaches to take the ownership of this plan which is comprehensive and put it through the lens of a tennis coach of a cross-country coach of a football coach and present their formal plan to Mr. Simmons to, for approval to make sure that they're hitting the guidelines that are in this comprehensive plan and uh, but they're thinking through every sport is a little bit different, different in terms of what that would look like so that training is scheduled for this this week um, if all goes well and we get board approval on the 29th then we are preparing a podcast and, and written. So some people we understand prefer reading versus listening to the podcast. So student athletes and families will have an opportunity to hear, they'll have the plan in, in a uh, web version for them to read. They'll have a podcast supporting the ideas that are important for student athletes and their families to understand. And there'll be some type of acknowledgement for a student athlete and family to say they have read they understand what their role and their responsibility is because everybody's in it together. The student athlete, the coaches, the parents, we need everybody pulling the oars for us to stay and keep doing what we want to do. If there's a breakdown, then that breakdown could lead to closure again and we don't want that. So it's going to be, uh, the message is going to be shared ownership 
to, to in order to participate. So that's phase one, and then phase two picks up whenever you have band camp and you have traditional practices and heat acclimation that starts kicking into fall season, which is around August 10th. And then phase three is when you get back to school competition time, and that's August 22nd through the fall season. So where we are right now in this comprehensive plan is very much focused on phase one because we've got to experience it to some degree and learn from it. So if there are modifications to this, obviously it would be shared here and then shared with the community. Uh, as an example, coaches have to wear a mask. So the coach will be in a mask for, uh, for this process. That's, that is a part of it. Uh, students need to bring their own water. We're not using water fountains. They're not sharing out of a communal water thing where they're put. So there are, I mean, there's that level of detail uh, in these. So will the plans that the coaches come up with those be approved by the district? Yes, that's correct. So those will be submitted to Mr. Simmons. Mm -hmm. We will review them and, and they will be approved at this level, not at the other yeah, Right, right, no, I understand, yeah. From the varsity board standpoint, obviously all those coaches are reporting directly to you. The one thing that I, we've had this conversation many times, but there's this dotted line that club sports, some of those club sports are going to be starting at the same time, but they carry the Pine Ridgeland name. Mm -hmm. Then if you trickle down from varsity, then you get into anybody else that has the Pine Ridgeland or they're using Pine Ridgeland facilities. Is this also going to be pushed to them, to those uh, you, you know, you think of a lacrosse, although I think they're going to start later, you think of hockey, some of those sports that are going to be starting up at the same time that don't have somebody directly reporting to anyone in the district, they're reporting to booster organizations. How do we ensure that, is there a plan to ensure that they're captured because we would hate to see them basically, for lack of a better term, cowboying on one side, we're doing something totally different, and then you have an outbreak there, and, and we've got to deal with that and say, well, why weren't these so just yeah, I would say yes. So what we're doing, we are inviting all of the coaches to participate in the professional development. And we typically do that if you think about our booster policy. You know, um, we share that with everyone. We invite every single group to our discussions so they hear the same messages that we're sharing that we believe are best practices for everyone to follow. Um, again, there, we don't have the oversight of the coaches with some of those club sports, but typically what has happened is they are responsive to our recommendations where they have been in the past and we would expect with something like that something like this that that would continue so they will be invited to and expected to participate in in those professional development sessions and they will be asked to submit what it's going to look like for their sport as well but initially we are we are keeping this very tight at the fall sports um, varsity level that's where we have to start to understand what it's going to look like for us and then we'll take it from there. And, and even our, our speaker tonight, you know, we understand. So since our schools closed on, you know, March 16th, we have been closed to every external group as well. And um, we understand the strong desire to, to be able to compete. And outside may be even different than inside when it comes to managing certain things. But at the same time, you know, we are not ready administratively to to open that door we're trying to open the first door first which is what does that look like for a small set of teams that we can directly oversee and manage and we understand there are other things to come but we're trying to take it one step at a time before um, before we go to to evaluate the next thing just just a question on policy uh, or in the uh, athletic I guess it is a policy, more or less, procedures. Yeah, the plan, the, health and safety plan. Yeah, there are two different references to concessions, and it, 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 it'll help me probably just understand the structure of the document, because there are also sort of three phases that are talked about throughout the document, and I think that may be why I'm confused on concessions. Okay. So there is a reference on page six that talks about concessions as you, know, you have to follow the existing guidelines and the, the Pine, Pine Ridge and School District concession stand guidelines. Further down in sort of the detail charts <coughs> on, let me just get that page, on page 11 it says, and I think this is specific to phases one and two of opening, concession stands are not permitted. Correct. But there's nothing in, that says in three they're explicitly permitted. It, and maybe I, 
it would help me to read it. Does that mean there's no mention in three, so therefore they are permitted, essentially? Well, so I, I won't, I'll let them answer, but I yeah. think that the reality of the reopening, nobody's ever reopened. And so, you know, the numbers that still sit, so for example, 250 is still a number. 250 is the maximum gathering size that currently exists. So, you know, step one is how do athletes condition safely? How can we begin that process? We know if that were to continue, you know, having the football team condition is a question. What about a Friday night and what would that look like? And who's able to be there? You know, and what about our marching band? Our marching band with our um, spawn, you know, directors, et cetera, is right at that number. And so what does that mean and how would we segment it? So I, I think when it comes to I think there's a whole lot of unknowns. I don't think this will be the only time this comes forward. I think for right now, to try to guess at what inter-school competition would look like and what is the role of con like concessions, even though I know you're not asking that, but we're so far away from that mm -hmm. that I don't think anybody has an idea of exactly what that's going to feel like or look like at this point. That's, that's yeah, all they, I, yeah. I can speak to that. Um, that was our goal, is thinking about the three phases and trying to develop this entire document, that's a real challenge. So, you know, right now our laser focus is on phase one. Phase one, there's no food, there's no snacks. You know, you bring, as Brian mentioned, you bring your own water. But as we get to phase three, which is competition, then concession is something that we need to talk about and what that's going to look like at that time. So, Working document, yeah. that answers my so, question. And yeah. it, so the, CD, the CDC guidelines for sport talk about increasing risk. And so, like, the lowest risk is exercise at home. And then you come together and start doing stuff. Then you're in more active gameplay. Then you're playing against teams from your region. Then you're playing against teams from um, other regions. And so it's all about sort of managing the risk. The hard part, I think, and this is why, and I don't, I don't think you were here at the time, the coaches and it's just coaches because that's what we're talking about Rob, right now they must own this you know no no blaming no, like it isn't something that you have to you send a positive message educate and be disciplined to the fundamentals it doesn't matter if your club soccer team is playing out there um, in some sort of other program not abiding by any of this stuff we can't control that the reality is that's going to also have an impact on how the disease progresses through the community, but that's one that we can't do. For, for our sports, how do we set those reasonable parameters, I think, is what this is about. I, I had a question on the, um, the screening tool. There was, there was mention of um, you know, before each practice or event, um, parents would do a home screening of their children for symptoms and then would uh, enter into a Google form the, the response and that would be reviewed by the coaches. Um, do we know how we would enforce compliance with that, um, you know, to get buy-in and support? Because that seems like if there's multiple kids, multiple sports, lots of practices a week, that's a, uh, you know, parents are going to get fed up with that pretty quick. So my response to that is, you know, that gets back to we're in this together. You know, we need parent support, whether it's for conditioning or when we come back to school in the fall, that it's going to take our collective efforts to do this. Um, so we're going to reinforce that. Um, our plan is if parents are able to manage that and submit that form prior to each practice, then we, that, would be, that would come in. The coach has that immediately. And obviously, if the student's healthy and temperature's in a good place, then there's no conversation. If parents don't have access or don't have the time or opportunity, then our athletic trainers um, are available and a coach would just privately, quietly ask that student to go through and conduct that with the trainer and then resume practice if, it, if, it, if all is good. So that is the initial plan. Again, that's a small number of students compared to thinking about yeah. 4,600 in the fall. Oh, yes. Right. We are with this. Uh, one other thing about this, I did a demo while you were not in here, Mr. Lyons, but um, with this amplification unit, um, Mr. Karpinski and Mr. Stobin are also looking to see whether a microphone could be purchased and 
a receiver that would attach to the interactive display boards that have sound panels on them already. So instead of a standalone unit, they're going to explore to see whether that option exists because then it can leverage the technology and, and sound boards we already have in here. So um, again, we're, we're looking at things like evaluating the face shields, evaluating this because ultimately, oh, I think I muted myself, there we go. Um, ultimately, you can return students, but if we're not providing a safe environment with the supports for staff to feel confident and comfortable, that isn't gonna work. And so we have to have the combination. Good. I, I do wanna thank you for all the time and effort that everyone in this room has put into these plans and everything, because I'm, I'm sure this is the, the most difficult and serious you know, time in education that any of you have ever faced in your careers and never imagined you'd be facing your careers. And, and from the health, you know, the health advisory panel to everything else you've been putting in place, just want to appreciate uh, all the hard work everyone's been doing and all the hard work that's left to be done this summer to figure out where we're headed in the fall. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we're, I tell you, we are anxious. Uh, the details are overwhelming. And again, trying to see those details implemented with thousands of students and hundreds of staff members in an active environment it takes a little bit of, like, it's hard to get the head wrapped around that right at this second. You know, you can think of all those specific details that emerge in school. So we'll do our best and um, we'll assert our voice at the intermediate unit because that, that work is going to help support the school districts as well. So uh, I don't want to um, take too much time, but I wanted to say, because I was in on the meeting for the Healthcare Leadership Council and listening to the, um, the 11 speakers uh, give their couple minute um, overview. It's very interesting. We have some very uh, experienced, uh, some good experts in the community. They have uh, a nice way of presenting themselves and, and of getting their information across and, and they really seem like they're, it's going to be a great team to work with. Um, so it, and it's very impressive, the, the information and the, um, the expertise. So we're, we're very lucky. Our game plan this Thursday, and it's just a rough plan. For, again, 43 is tough for interaction, so we did it on the first call, but we will likely take components of that in-person list and we'll subgroup and then we'll create breakout Google Meets so that we can have a couple of healthcare people in each of those rooms and then we can really get into the weeds on, let's say, transportation and cafeteria. What does that look like, et cetera? Mrs. Misbeck did a great job. <laughs> I knew, I knew that. So I apologize uh, for my delay. I was a, a little double booked here earlier. I can assure you that the uh, the 37 minutes that I missed, I will go back and watch. Thank you for all the input, all the work. It's ongoing. Item 3.01 is our consent agenda. A motion to approve items 3.01 to 3.18 as presented. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? I know there is no such thing as a mundane uh, motion. I value them all, but there is a lot of meat here, especially in the middle part around academic achievement. There's a lot of work that goes into each of these. So thank you to every key member of the administration to bring these forward. Any other comments? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Kashani, finance, please. Item 4.01 is a motion to approve the financial reports dated April 30th, 2020, and accounts payable dated June 22nd, 2020, in the amount of $303,941.58, and paid accounts for May, June, in the amount of $6,039,690.48 as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.02, motion to approve the budget transfers in the amount of $1,067,745 as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.03, 
motion to authorize the transfer of $873,710 from the general fund to the capital reserve fund. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 4.04 .04 is a discussion about our next bond refunding. Actually, recap the one we just did and to discuss the one that's on deck, Series 2010. Um, may I ask Dana to, uh, is Dana, where's Dana? Yep, she's right here. Oh, hi, Dana. <laughs> maybe, maybe what would be helpful is just for the board to hear um, your recommendation, if that's fair to ask. I fell asleep while I was back there, sorry. I'm limping my way up here. Um, so our first year funding we had just finished um, last week. We were expecting a savings in the approximately $800,000 to $900,000 range. And our savings was actually about $1.2 million, which is terrific. What we decided to do with that, um, with that refunding was similar to what we've done with the other ones and shorten the term. Very similar to like a home mortgage whenever you just shorten the number of years. Um, we have done that for a number of our refundings over the last couple of years. So in your, in your um, agenda, there is an update for Mr. Masidi, and it does show you kind of some scenarios on page, I believe it is page 10. Yes, is page yeah, 10. Sure. Um, and then page 11 will also kind of show you what it looks like with our current um, debt service schedule. So every time we have done a refunding that creates that kind of like a shortened, yes. So that one right there is our, um, is our comparison of our options for our next refunding. So the next refunding will settle in July. But what we're looking for is kind of a consensus on how we wanna do the savings. So when we've done our um, refundings for the past couple of years, again, we've kind of shortened the term and it's created holes in our overall debt portfolio. So our long-term plan from the last couple of years has been to take this large refunding and kind of fill in those holes. The orange column that is shown on page 11 does do that, but it also creates kind of like a hybrid cash flow um, savings for us that will give us annual debt service savings over the next six years as well. So not only does it kind of step down and sort of kind of fill in those holes and squeeze things in a bit, but it will also give us about um, $250,000 to $300,000 worth of savings over the next three fiscal years, and then some kind of minimal annual debt service savings over the next couple of years following that. Um, the overall projected net present value savings from that option is just under $9 million. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to kind of open it up for any discussion, kind of based on the different scenarios that are shown here. Well, maybe I might suggest that um, since we've talked about this in committee, and I think most of us were there for a couple discussions in the committee meetings, um, is it fair to say, is it fair to say, Dr. Miller, Dana, that the uh, the administration's uh, preference would be the hybrid uh, step down, the one that you, you personally just mentioned? that would be my recommendation, and the reason why is because it still follows our initial long term plan that we have talked about all along, which is kind of smoothing out our debt service um, and filling in those holes. It does still provide us with a large amount of savings, but it does give us a little bit of flexibility in our annual budgets over the next couple of years. So one of the things we talked about was one of our key initiatives as we face this upcoming year is to really get an understanding of budget and finance. A large key piece of that is because our funding and our revenue is uncertain over the next couple of years. So we have to look at what our local sources of um, revenue have been and that's, you know, 80% of our revenue comes from our local um, taxpayers. So pieces of that 
are coming in through real estate. It's also real estate transfer tax whenever there are sales of properties. Um, it's also earned income tax. You know, we have experienced large amounts of unemployment in our state and in our region. And so we really have to kind of understand how is that going to affect our community and our budget moving forward. Um, again, in my personal recommendation, I think that the hybrid not only accomplishes a long-term future goal that we've had and that we've talked about for many years, it does still provide us significant savings overall in the overall piece of that um, debt, but it will give us some annual flexibility in our debt service as well. So may I ask, does anyone feel strongly against the hybrid? I, I, you know, I used to be all in for shorten it, shorten it, shorten it, because this is essentially borrowing um, if by extending borrowing. But my, my take on the fiscal picture and the outlook is that those monies in especially 22 and especially 23 are, are worth their interest rate. Mm -hmm. So I'm good with the hybrid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. Thank, Thank you, Dana. Thank you. Just want to add, I think Mr. Masidi is going to go to a bi-weekly update. Okay. I believe he is, yeah. yes. So that's I've correct. been attaching for the board almost weekly. We're going to go to a bi-weekly, okay. mm -hmm. and then as Dana said, this issue comes up in July. In July, yes. Yeah. So we'll touch base with him this evening, let him know, um, you know where we're headed and the fact that we have a consensus. I'll continue to keep you all updated on um, on the schedule for the second refunding as well. Quick quick question. On the one we just did, we got additional savings we were expecting. Was that just from a more favorable interest rate than we expected or what would? It was. It was, well, because the market has been so volatile, um, you know, I don't want to say it was hit or miss, but I think that we did somewhat lock into some good financial market conditions on that day. Um, I also want to say that I think in the era of COVID-19 and the fact that the economy, not only nationwide, um, but within our state is challenging, it is, you know, it is definitely an attribute to the board and to the district that we did not get downgraded in our bond rating. Um, not for any reason of anything that we've done incorrectly, but because of the nature of the economy as, as we are right now. Um, what ended up happening is that our bonds were very favorable and look very stable compared to some others that could be out there at the same time. So it's definitely favorable for us. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. And I think that's it for finance. Thanks, Mark. Mr. Tobio, Buildings and Grounds. Item 5.01 is a update on the summer projects and Dana should probably just stay there I guess or is there anything in particular? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to say in this case I will defer any specific questions back to um, Mr. Zimmerman. I can tell you from the chart that he has attached what he's tried to do is kind of give you somewhat of an idea of what our ongoing maintenance idea or um, projects as well as the large projects that we have coming up. So what he's trying to do is he's staging those board approvals. So you'll continue to see those. I think there's a few on this evening for information that we're going to have approved in July. And we're trying to actually stage those projects so that they're manageable. Because you might remember that we're also replacing the high school roof. So that project um, is quite large and is being covered by um, insurance proceeds. In addition to that, because we're working through the stadium turf replacement, the Field 6 project, and we're even getting started on discussions about the green gym and the high school gym, you know, we're trying to make sure that within his department, we can focus on the start of the school year, as well as trying to stage some of these projects to get them, you know, accomplished. But if anyone has any specific questions, please let me know. And then I'll reach back out to him. Yeah, Richland window projects going on as well. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't, uh, when you drive around, take a look even at the roof and what's happening here. Would we say close to 5.9 million worth of capital projects mm -hmm. when you add the 2.9 for the roof uh, yeah. happening, you know, within the district? So it's it's pretty significant. 
do you know if in general we've ran into any issues with contractors being pushed back because they couldn't work for those couple months? I've not heard slipped it. on anything. I know we were anxious that we thought we could actually get ahead. Correct. Um, is that still where we're sitting? Okay. We are. We, yeah. we wanted a head start to finish at the same finish line. Yes. I mean that that was the goal, and thus far we've not heard anything um, different than that. Yep. Yeah. I, I will say. You know, again, it, it ties back to the COVID-19. So part of the part of our slides for in-person have to do with ventilation and HVAC, and so we have a preventive maintenance schedule and filter replacement both on the unit ventilators and also on the rooftop units. So that's a part of what's going on. But we talked in a call today, so we can increase. So for example, one way to increase ventilation is open a window. When you open a window, you um, you bring in outside air. Outside air has pollen and all sorts of things. What happens when you in introduce pollen into an indoor environment with students who have allergies? They cough and sneeze. So when you cough and sneeze, right? I mean, so it's just um, amazing to think about you know how we balance all that. But we are they are looking at that. Yeah. I want to say that these reports are great to have. I mean, yeah. they've been getting more detail and more more information mm -hmm. to the, the project management he's it's definitely yeah, visible it's a here. certain yeah, yeah. certainly a area of talent and interest for mr zimmer could you print wallet card size ones for people <laughs> say hey go, what's going on at richland i drove past there the other week but uh it's it's great i can always find the answer for them if i don't know mm -hmm. it, so. this print's not small enough for you <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, as, as everyone listens to this, I'm, I'm going to recommend that 5.02 through 5.05 be put on consent agenda for the July meeting um, because they're all motions that we're going to consider at the July meeting. If anyone wants anything pulled out, obviously we can. Um, but based on the detail that the administration goes through on all of these, I'm, I'm comfortable with everything that we have in front of us. Plus, I know we're still waiting for some on 5.04, but I'll go through them. Uh, 5.02 is going to be a motion to approve a microprocessor replacement on a chiller at Richmond Elementary um, for about $21,000. Um, anyone have any questions on that one? Okay. Uh, item 5.03 is a motion to approve at the July meeting um, the purchase and replacement of carpet at the high school by Franklin Interiors. Uh, the cost is going to be $33,000. Anyone have a question with that? And item 5.04, again, uh, for consideration at the uh, combined July meeting, will be a motion to approve floor replacement at the high school's pool locker room. Uh, the vendor and the amount have not yet been determined, but it will be through the uh, quote system through CoStars. Um, again, unless uh, somebody sees something uh, uh, come up, I would recommend a consent agenda on those three. Great, thanks, Greg. Student services, Dr. Campbell. All right, uh, item 7.01, uh, we had a uh, meeting of the Pine Ridge Athletic Hall of Fame Selection Committee. Um, they reviewed the nominations, and based on the bylaws, they have selected uh, five nominees and one team for uh, the second uh, class of uh, nominees to the Hall of Fame. So I want to congratulate, uh, is it Alimer? Anyone know how to pronounce it? Is it Alimer Girdwood? Uh, Robert McDonough? Uh, Carrie Walker, uh, Brett Warren, and Kristen Wissey. Actually, uh, Chrissy had a milestone birthday on Saturday, so happy birthday to Chrissy Wissey, um, a classmate of mine, and uh, this is a belated birthday present being nominated for the Hall of Fame. Um, also, we have the 1988 Girls Cross Country um, team, which was our first state champion uh, in school history. So congratulations to that team and to our five nominees this year. We hope to be able to celebrate um, your induction uh, the weekend of October 16th and 17th in the fall if health and safety guidelines permit. So that's an information item um, uh, now. And then we have uh, 702, which is the um, a, a uh, scheduled uh, student services committee meeting. We want to hold one on July 13th, uh, beginning at 6 p.m. to discuss school safety, um, uh, school safety and security and culture. Um, and those are the two items for student services. And I think we'll have to determine whether that's virtual or in person. I'm not sure that we have to. Yeah, we're, go ahead. We would need to advertise differently, but we'll, we'll have some discussion on that the July meeting date. So we only have one meeting date right now in July. More than one meeting, but one date. 
correct one day combined meeting so I think we'll I think we'll get to some of that discussion uh, down below on 10.2 Thanks, Ben. Dr. Mihalik, Staff Services. Thanks. Uh, starting off, we have an action item, uh, item 8.01, personnel, a motion to approve personnel and supplementals as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Dr. Mihalik, if you don't mind, I just want yeah. to acknowledge Mr. Kenny. He probably doesn't want that, uh, but for many years, eight years, uh, he has served the community and district as Director of HR and Legal Affairs. Um, we are saddened to see him go. We're happy for him. We have unbelievable uh, admiration for him as a member of our team. Uh, we rely on him. Um, he is just a relationship builder with our staff and community and so uh, we wish Owen the very best and and officially here at a meeting we just I just want to again thank you uh, professionally and personally for who you are and what you've provided to the district uh, with all those kind words you think we didn't have to sit him in the middle of the room with <laughs> a child who just we, we need to you sit right here yeah. where we can see you Mr. Kenny, what the voice? <laughs> I can give him the voice amplification system. <laughs> <laughs> we can roast him too. <laughs> yeah. If I can just say also, um, you know, I'm new to the staff services rep role here, and I've enjoyed working with Owen in the short time, and he's imparted his total wisdom onto me during our discussion right before this at our board retreat. So. You have uh, taught me a civility and a rationality to contract negotiations that I will uh, bear with me for better uh, for as long as I continue in this role in one form or another. So thank you very much. Item 8.02, 2019-2020 superintendent and assistant superintendent's performance ratings. An action item, a motion to, improve, to approve the assistant superintendent's 2019-2020 performance ratings as listed and the superintendent's 2019-2020 performance rating as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 8.03. 2020-2021 contracted administrator salaries an action item a motion to approve the 2020-2021 contracted administrator salaries as attached second is there any discussion all those in favor say yes yes, yes. yes. opposed motion carries item 8.04 2020-2021 act 93 salaries an action item motion to approve the 2020 2021 Act 93 administrator salaries as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And item 8.05 is an action item a motion to approve the 2020 2021 administrator support personnel salaries as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Item 10.01 is a motion to approve Mrs. Christine Mizpeck and Dr. Carla Meyer as voting delegates for the PSBA 2020 Delegate Assembly. Second. Is there any discussion? Thank you both for your willingness to serve. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it's in person or not, so. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mm -hmm. Item 10.02 is a discussion around scheduling an additional June board meeting um, around the topic of 
<coughs> return to school, specifically our athletic plan, as was discussed tonight. I don't think we need to add more. I think we highlighted it. Uh, so this is just a discussion item <coughs> to have Barb advertise the June 29th virtual meeting at noon uh, for the purposes of approving plans so they are in place before July 1. Okay. Any comments so, just on that schedule? Yeah. So, so I would just have a one hour limit on that. Yeah. So at one o'clock, I would need to, to drop off whatever. That won't be a problem, Matt. Mark paid Matt to say that. Yeah, so. it, <laughs> if, if, here's what I would say. If there are questions that you have on what was presented this evening, please send them to Dr. P as soon as you know of them. But barring any questions given the time we took, it might be a five minute meeting. The only thing I would say is we will add some likely some personnel items because we have some recommended candidates and since we'll take advantage of the fact that this meeting exists. Um, Dr. Mel, I just want to bring up, I should be able to attend, but it's accreditation day. So I might have to step off. The over-unders, 15 minutes. <laughs> and I think I have a conflict at 1230, but I can always push that. I might be able to push that back if we run long. Do we want to just make it 11 I, I mean we're not going to go an hour and it's not to go an hour but if you've got 1230 as well is 1130 or do you if, it, if we have our accreditation it's all day I just have to be on call so so that one's indifferent but it's a net plus for you two right yeah 1130 1130 uh, which kind of leads into my next topic it's something like that happens very easily when we meet in real life I've I've missed the cadence of those opposed, motion approved. Uh, you guys are of great voice tonight. I miss that. Uh, nonetheless, to a certain extent, we, we engage in the activities in real life that has some level of risk that we need to. And so what we need to decide as a board is what we need to do in real life uh, and what we can do with a much lower layer of risk and possibly even additional convenience as our virtual meetings have been. I would preview this by saying I don't want to look too far in the future <clears throat> because uh, we are not required to file a plan <laughs> with PD that explains how we're going to conduct our meetings in October. So let's make those decisions as they come. Right now we're faced with next week, which makes sense, a uh, limited topic of limited duration to go virtual. And we have one meeting night with student services and a combined meeting in mid-July. Uh, historically, that is a, a short meeting in July. Um, historically, yes. Again, I, I expect we will have a lot of meat for return to school. So there's two things really that I see as obviously huge. That is the, the most critical one. The second is around uh, redistricting update as those types of things, uh, that process continues to unfold. So. Um, I don't know that it'll be an extensive agenda, but those are two definite meaty topics that we'll discuss. And we can discuss them virtually or in person. I don't have a preference either way, but I think those will be important discussions. Does anyone have a feeling? I mean, I'll make a recommendation that we conduct both meetings in July virtually. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to the board? That's all we need yeah. to decide yeah. tonight on, on that. I, I know in general I will add that I've received one-on-one -on -one comment repeatedly that our, our meetings, Mr. Stobener, <clears throat> management of the logistics between you and Ms. Williams has been tremendous. So I feel our communication is being facilitated properly. I think everyone feels they're being heard. We have the opportunity to hear each other. Mm -hmm. So uh, tremendous job, tremendous job. Item 10.03 is a review of the board workshop. I was there this morning. Board and senior leadership team workshop was held prior to this meeting. Uh, it is an opportunity to uh, hear from senior leadership post their retreat, which takes place earlier this month. It's when we sort of take a breather and focus again on what motivates us, focus again on our, our proper role but we also take a look at the strategic plan as we move through it, recalibrate, and this certainly was an opportunity to, to recalibrate, um, and come together and define 
better some of the goals under that plan for the coming school year. I don't know if other board members would like to share more. I had to step out early for the IU meeting, but. Yeah, so we discussed our, um, our, we reviewed our goals from that we had set from last year, and there was really no desire to change the goals at all. It was just to work on action plans within to, to be a little bit more targeted in uh, um, uh, external stakeholder uh, engagement, uh, and then also documenting some of that too. Um, so, and then also with the communication plan, Again, you know, the end of the year when we had the three communications, end of the school year, the budget, and the uh, annual report uh, that was aligned with the with the district. Um, so that was the end of the year, but there was nothing through the year. But this, so now what we're talking about is trying to do maybe something a little more scheduled through the year. And again, documenting so that we know what we've done. So doing like somewhat of a dashboard. Dr. Miller, you had mentioned a little bit about. Um, how we would like once a month yeah we'll just increase the frequency that we share you know updated information with the board so uh, monthly updates and then quarterly the dashboard so that way people can mm -hmm. track it in you know real time right so is there anything else I want to thank you all for your willingness to come out early uh, on what Sometimes beautiful summer evenings, sometimes uh, coming down buckets of rain, but in any, any case, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. That's a worthwhile time. Reports. Are there any reports from board members? I just want to thank Mr. Simmons for running a great um, Hall of Fame committee meeting where we voted on the inductees. We have a great committee, nice cross-section, and uh, everyone's very respectful, professional, and they take it seriously, and they engage. So, and Mr. Simmons does a really nice job running that. Good. So, Thanks. want to acknowledge him. Great. Thank you, Warren. Yeah, we had a, a A.W. Beatty board meeting on uh, last Thursday. We actually, in person, we went in, and, and uh, the reason for really being in person was to take a look at classrooms that they were trying they will be uh, knocking out some walls to make some larger space moving some of the, the programs around for next year some of the programs are expanding some are contracting a little bit uh, depending on enrollment and and speaking of enrollment right now they have about uh, a little over some over 800 they're looking at probably 850 or more for next year and they are just getting started working with some of the graduating graduate students already in getting their certifications that they weren't able to get through the uh, school year at the end of the school year and working with the employers and so on um, so that they can be certified to, for their employment so anything else Kasha the well, safety the discussion too, but they are not anywhere close no <laughs> Um, we had a uh, Pine Parks meeting uh, in person, first one since uh, we had the COVID uh, in person. Um, on June 9th, the rec center opened on June 8th. They're going through a lot of the similar discussions that we're having, challenges with spacing, things like that. As I walked in, if you're familiar with the center, the normal meeting room where the supervisors meet on the right, as I walked by, there was a spin class going on because they <laughs> needed spacing. So right. the uh, you know there's some gives and takes you know the good thing is it's open uh, part of the problem is uh, because of space uh, all of the gym floors are taken up for different classes things like that so just just keeping things spaced out one positive thing again still working through some challenges but it looks like they're um, on target to open mid-july the um, splash pad over there so that's going to be a big attraction uh, again going through the challenges of spacing and making sure that uh, um, you know you keep social distance with a bunch of kids running around at a splash <laughs> pad but also you know one of the things that we really talked about a lot was uh, there needs to be something for kids to do this summer they've been um, they've been lacking and in, in being able to get out and things like that so this will be one of the things in the community especially with a lot of the pools closed that uh, that we'll be able to offer through Pine Parks again that's as long as everything goes according to plan with uh, weather and with uh, uh, contracting and everything so 
Yeah, one with Prof. There was just one, and there was no. They're, they're off for the summer, as far as meetings go, not not working. But uh, they did uh, do a challenge um, at, uh, for raising money for the North Hills Community Outreach, and they were. I don't remember the exact amount, but somewhere around nine thousand two hundred dollars or something that they were able to raise for um, uh, their program. So food bank, you know, thinking as, as one of the areas that, that North Hills does um, for them, but other other outreach as well. So they did a uh, challenge of like 3,000 they would match, and then they upped that, and they were able to get almost up to the 10,000 became a goal at one point, so. That was a great program. Mm -hmm. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If I could just add just one update. Um, as we've shared before, uh, we, we have shared the July 24th as a possible option for a graduation ceremony with our community. Uh, we are working with the high school staff to send a communication out this week. Uh, the reality right now with the CDC guidelines is still uh, that 250 or, or less requirement. We think makes it unlikely for that July 24th event to happen, so we will communicate that. Uh, we are not saying definite no. We are using July 10th as kind of going to be our last date of making that final decision because if it is a yes then obviously we have to communicate and talk about um, how we get some practice time with the kids but we want you know to be upfront and honest with our community to let them know that uh, we at this point believe it's unlikely that that July 24th event will occur we have talked to the student body and the parents and community about some type of recognition in the fall probably around homecoming so the communication will be to give them that clear update um, to provide them with an opportunity to give us some feedback like if we can't have it will you still participate we feel like the events that we had for them with the virtual graduation and the face-to-face -face event where they received their diploma and had opportunities for pictures uh, was um, of high quality and, and appreciated by, by our students and families so we're not even certain how many if we offer the july 24th will participate so there'll be a little bit of a response request around that and also around if we are able to offer something in the fall would you be interested in coming back and participating so um, we're finalizing that communication it's going to go out sometime this week uh, and that will go to our senior families and senior students and that ongoing graduation was really spectacular. Thank you, Mr. Karpinski and, and Mr. Clack and, and, and Sean and everyone behind that. That was that was a really nice, you know, online you know ceremony to watch and and, uh, and great to be able to feature every student like that. And it was on twenty two the point as a recap too, which was pretty cool. And it's on where? I'm sorry, you said it was on where? Twenty two the point. Twenty two the point yeah. that Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Uh -huh. So I have uh, uh, two brief updates. Uh, Dr. Miller and I have the opportunity, we take it once a year to give uh, in-person updates to Pine and Richland Township's Board of Supervisors, uh, which we did last week. We've also shifted this year to sending monthly updates, which contain more detail. So we're able to have a bit of more conversational tone to the, to the meeting. Uh, we find it greatly beneficial to check in, uh, just make that personal connection. Uh, we feel the supervisors feel the same way. So a very positive and collegial uh, meeting. We did get an update on your splash pad, Greg. <laughs> we caught it at the beginning of the meeting, so. Um, August one, but we'll see. I was gonna say, uh, looks, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Um, the other is an update from the IU. Uh, tonight was our, our reorganization meeting and also the last meeting uh, to be presided over by uh, Roseanne Jaworski, who has been two years as our interim director. So. In uh, mid end of July, uh, Dr. Robert Shear from North Allegheny uh, will fill that seat. So <laughs> we uh, bid Roseanne a fond adieu, although she's really just moving a few cubicles over to Director of Learning and Development again. And you want to? I, I want to. I appreciate working with Roseanne. She did a great job in the interim role. But one of the things that's evident that people don't always realize is how diverse the school districts in Allegheny County are. And so one of the, the realities of serving on the IU board or as the interim director at the AIU is you really see um, we're in the same, same educational sector, 
but there are really community-based distinct needs and strategies that are necessary. And so take anything like what we're dealing with now and then look at it through the lens of different communities. It's really remarkable to see. And as, uh, as often over these past few months, I've ridden my bike or jogged over to sign some papers. I've had many papers brought to me uh, at home. Uh, I can't run down to Homestead, unfortunately. Uh, the IU has been busy at work and has secured over a million and a half dollars in grants uh, from local foundations to support schools and support communities as they struggle with the return to normalcy, struggle with purchasing PPE, new learning materials, professional development, some things that we take for granted that we have the resources to tap into to provide. Uh, so the IU is finding and, and creating a role to support those communities. And, uh, you know, as a board, we understand that we're going to have to do more in that direction as we enter into the fall. Any other updates? We'll move to our second recognition of visitors. No one online, I assume. Make sure I get the topics right for the next. I went to the wrong I use. I went to the wrong board. Okay. Before we adjourn the board, we're holding executive discussion to discuss negotiations, personnel, uh, safety, and security. Meeting adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.